You are listening to Real Men Feel with Andy Grant. Real Men Feel encourages men to allow and express all of their emotions. Despite what you may have been taught, all emotions do serve you. Real Men Feel is committed to engaging in discussions that most men aren't having, but all men can benefit from. All links mentioned in each episode are in the show notes found on the blog at realmenfeel.org. Now, let's get to it. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Real Men Feel. This is your host, Andy Grant. You know, emotions are a base part of, of us as humans and a base part of this program. And it's, it's to encourage men to feel, to encourage men to realize that they do have emotions. There aren't some emotions that are good or bad or for men or for women. That's really part of the genesis of this program. So I'm really excited to dig deeper into that today. Um, today I have a, as a guest an internationally recognized expert on facial coding and the role of emotions in business, politics, sports, and popular culture. So I'm glad to welcome speaker, author, and emotions expert, Mr. Dan Hill to the show. Thank you so much. Happy to be here, Andy. It's awesome. And we've talked a couple of times and I was looking through your, your most recent book you call, is called um, Famous Faces Decoded. And I've been looking through that over the past few days and it's it's captivating. It's fascinating. It's a fun read. I'm really, I'm really impressed, and I'm, I'm impressed by how much fun it is. Well, that's good because I worked really hard to get to that because <laughs> there's a lot of information that I did not want people to be drinking through a fire hose. Yeah. I actually wanted them to enjoy. I wanted them to think it was a margarita instead. <laughs> that's, that's a great attitude. I've, I haven't heard any author talk about my book is the, uh, you know, a paperback margarita. <laughs> fun. So, to get people, you know, all on the same page, and, you know, I think people have at least heard the term emotional intelligence and EQ, but could you tell us what, could you define that for us? Well, I think emotional intelligence involves several steps. One, one is understanding yourself. I, I don't think you can make a lot of progress unless you're really prepared to dig in on that front. Then I think it means also being able to recognize the feelings of others, which is where facial coding will come into our conversation. Uh, and then it's a couple other pieces. One is knowing what emotions actually are, what they mean, what's the triggers, the motivations, and then how you're going to apply that emotional intelligence in situations. And one of the reasons I love facial coding, which is basically the ability to read other people's emotions from their facial muscle activity, is then I can respond in the moment. Yes, I might pick it up by their action. I might pick it up by their voice. But the face is a wonderful visual way to say, in this moment, in this conversation, in this experience, I can get some clues as to how the other pe person is feeling. And that gives me more intelligence to make my adjustments and move forward accordingly. Cool. All right. And so you mentioned in that answer the importance of knowing what emotions are. So how would yes. you define emotions? Well, emotions are different from feelings, first of all. Uh, feelings is a term that psychologists actually hold for that which we think we feel is the way I guess I'll say it. That which is cognitively filtered. Um, so we put up all sorts of roadblocks. You know, we don't want to encounter our emotions in a lot of situations. You know, we think they make us vulnerable and so on. Emotions, on the other hand, is really what is intuitively happening to us. And we might get some glimpses, but we won't get a very full glimpse, which is one of the reasons I love facial coding, because it gives us the visual component to try to understand the iceberg. Because when I started I run a company called Sensory Logic. The reason I began it basically is someone at IBM changed my life. They sent over an article about the breakthroughs in brain science with an absolutely killer statistic that the conservative estimation is that 95% of our mental activity is not fully conscious, is not fully conscious. So in other words, there's all this emotion going on and we just think feelings, the surface part is good enough. You know, this is how I think I'm feeling but it's really how I feel my feelings. That's the key thing. And that's emotions. Cool. And so emotional intelligence is, is, is knowing ourselves first and our ability to, to see and read the emotions accurately of, of other people. Is that something that is innately in us? Is it, is it a skill that's learned? Can it change over time? I think it's innately in us, but the problem is it's almost as if we want to lie to ourselves and to others or be lied to. It's amazing to me how much people go with the, the verbal input. There's a wonderful uh, study done at UCLA. They looked at what they called ambiguous situations. It might be a first date. Uh, it might be a job hire interview. It could be all sorts of things. But in an ambiguous situation, they concluded that 55% of the true information was conveyed through the face. 38% through the voice, and merely 7% through the words. 
So I think what we do is we, we jump to the words. We think somehow that's going to be good enough, and it just isn't. Actions speak louder than words, and the action of the facial muscle movements is the kind of action I like because it gives me a clue to what's going on with someone else, and it probably gives me a clue of what's going on with me because emotions are very contagious back and forth between people. And in that dynamic, I'm going to get a better sense than I ever could verbally or consciously, cognitively as to what's going down. So you mentioned that, that someone at IBM shared you with that article years ago. And so is that what immediately got you into learning more about facial coding? Uh, yes and no. I mean, you know, you've, you've been very open about your own struggles, and so I'm going to be open as well. So I, I went through divorce, not really to my preference. My wife fell in love with some other guy. And um, so lo and behold, I, I decided to move back to the Midwest from Minnesota. So I was in a job search as well as a new mate search, both at the same time. And I, I read three different pieces that all helped me and kind of came together. Uh, one was talking about early childhood and how much early childhood really makes a difference. This is Balby and attachment theory, which some of your other guests may have talked about. I'm happy to go into it a bit in a moment, but it's really about how so early in life, again, before, pre, before consciousness, we have patterns that start to set in, often based on how we relate to our parents, first and foremost. Then there was a wonderful book that I happened to see in the library called The Alchemy of Love and Lust. I mean, if that's not a title that grabs your interest, nothing will. And it was talking about how much we have biochemical reactions, you know, uh, serotonin and this and that and testosterone and how it drives our behavior, again, beyond our conscious recognition. So I was almost primed, in fact, for the thing that the IBM guy sent over. Uh, because it was just the, it was the third piece, third stool of the leg, as it were. And within five minutes of reading the article, my hands were trembling. I went, this is so cool. This is so interesting. Mm -hmm. We are all emotional decision makers. It's not just because I'm going through a divorce and job search and all these things and all my own personal turmoil. We all are bathed by our emotions, and we have to navigate them, recognize them, respect them, and, and progress through them and with their help, actually. So until you had reached that point of, of hitting challenges in your own life and then getting the science to kind of open your mind, were you a man that allowed emotions to be part of your experience? Well, I would say yes, but not, not with as much knowledge and insight. Uh, I, mean, I was a poet earlier in my career, so poetry is pretty much emotionally oriented to no small degree. Uh, I played a lot of sports. I thought I was a good teammate. I would try to read the emotions of who I was up against, who I was guarding on the basketball court or the soccer field or something. So I, I think I was somewhat clued in. But when I started doing the reading, it was amazing to me what I didn't know. I, had I really ever thought about what anger means as an emotion, how it's triggered, uh, let alone how it shows in the face? The answer is categorically no. I mean, I was missing a lot of the picture. And even though I you know, I got a PhD, I'd like to think I'm a fairly intelligent guy. But it's amazing what we don't know. It, there's so much we don't know I mean, all the time, endlessly. Cool. It's, it's so, humbling. So in... It's kind of the involuntary muscles of our face display our emotions more than our words or, or thoughts or in intuition or even. Is, so is that different from body language or does body language kind of in sync with the face? Well, body language is just much more gross, less defined. I mean, you can tell if someone is basically aggressive or submissive or open, but body language pretty much just goes into those three categories. Okay. Uh, facial coding can go to seven emotions, not kind of three states. So it's more specific. It acknowledges the fact that you might be in more than one emotion at the same time. And body language has a f couple of other problems to it. One is it's affected by gender and by race and ethnicity. There are hand gestures, for instance, that will be fine in Sicily and get you killed in Belgium or vice versa. Okay. Uh, so it's got a cultural overlay to it. You can also fake the body language gestures much more easily. You can decide you're going to show this in the job interview or you're going to look calm and open in the date, but you're not really emotionally speaking. You're just throwing it out there. So it's, it's not as reliable. And the face is so cool for a couple of reasons. One is Charles Darwin was the first scientist to take emotions seriously. He said to himself, if they didn't matter to us, they would have weaned out of us over the course of evolution. They must give us a chance to survive and thrive. And it's true. And then he said, well, okay, so where do emotions show up most readily? It's in the face because the face is the only place in the body where the muscles attach right to the skin. 
It is quick, real-time data. Hmm. There is, and we have more facial muscles than any other species on the planet. And it is universal. Even a person born blind emotes the same way as you or I. Hmm. The underlying physiology is the same. So it's kind of like boom, boom, boom. These are three great attributes that frankly lift it way beyond body language. Hmm. And I've always heard that it, it takes um, more muscles to frown than to smile. So we really has to be like a concerted effort to be angry or show that, display that. Is that accurate? Well, there, there are 44, yes, basically, because there are 44 muscles in the face. And there are only one muscle, the zygomatic muscle, that's involved in a smile involving the cheeks. Hmm. And then if you do get that, that twinkle in the eye, the true smile, then that's one more you know, set of muscles around the eyes. But a lot of times we just have what's called the social smile where that, that cheek raises. Whereas in anger, for instance, there are nine different ways anger can show in the face. Mm. We are bathed in anger because anger is frankly very helpful adaptively, evolutionary wise. We need to fight through barriers, take on enemies, challenges. We need to make progress. So I think one of the things that's important for your listeners is we should stop stigmatizing anger as necessarily a problem that guys own. Mm. It's through guys index higher in anger but anger can have its downside and it can have its upside. Cool. And, and we, should, we should be able to go there. Um, right. Valid emotion. Right. Yeah, like every emotion is valid. It's something that I've absolutely. always believed. Yeah. So oh, yes, absolutely. Anger is a problem when we deny it, we stuff it, we don't feel it. But or we use it in a way that's destructive to ourselves and others. Then that's not so cool. All right. So you mentioned that body language can be kind of faked and hidden and controlled. So can someone disguise their facial cues? They're going to try two things, most likely. They're going to try to go to poker face. They're going to try to show nothing. And there's where a term that's really important comes into play, micro expressions, that you might show something really briefly on the face, like for a fraction of a second. So quick little story. I, I'm in China. I'm at the Great Wall. I'm going to be speaking on Monday in Beijing. And I'm talking to a guy, and he says, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm, I guess I'd have to say I'm a market researcher. He looks really bored. I can tell this because I'm a facial coder. And I said, well, it's a bit different than that. I read people's faces. And he goes, oh, micro expressions. And I said, uh, that's not exactly a household term. Do you mind if I ask you what you do for a living? He said, well, officially, I work for Halliburton. But actually, uh, I'm the CIA substation chief in Saudi Arabia, and I've used facial coding for 15 years Wow! in interrogation and surveillance. So yes, the micro expression is a really good way to pick up somebody who's trying the poker face route. The other one is the camouflage with a smile. And all animals camouflage. I was in Botswana for a non-hunting safari a couple of years ago. It's amazing how every animal needs a camouflage. I mean, it's tough out there. And human beings tend to go to the smile an awful lot to hide and mask what's really going on for them. Cool. So when you do the facial coding of someone, is it just about that moment in time? Or does it actually tell you something about a person's dominant emotions all the time? Oh, dominant emotions is really the fun way to go ultimately. I mean, in the moment is, is vital to all sorts of encounters we have. But if I'm talking about a long-term relationship, whether it's significant other or my boss or whomever it may be, uh, I want to really say what's the patterns here because human beings do have patterns. Uh, a wonderful comment from George Orwell said, by the age of 50, a man has the face he deserves. And it's true. We have repeated patterns. We have what I call signature expressions. So yes, I like to look through a series of photographs. It could be video, but if I'm going to do video, I don't want it just to be this moment, this speech, this occasion. I want to see that I, I feel enough confidence. Not that you can be absolutely sure that you have the mysteries of human nature unraveled. I mean, human beings are complicated. Hmm. But I think you can get closer. You can get a reasonable stab at some of the things that are going on or are prominent for people. Okay, so to get an overall view of someone, you, you, you don't rely on just one picture or one video. Oh, it's, absolutely, yeah. absolutely okay. not. Right, absolutely cool. not. And, and, and you mentioned that you, you, you use this in the business setting. So, so how does facial coding get used in business? Well, I actually did work for more than half the world's top 100 companies, B2C companies. So pretty good for a boutique. <laughs> um, and I fought through my fear in starting the company. As we're talking here, I have a little stone that someone gave me, a memento. It said, you can do it. Because when I started, I really wondered if I was going to be able to make this. Right. Not only because I didn't really have much background in business, but because I was also really stepping out. 
I mean, business world is not very good at recognizing emotions mm -hmm. and the role of emotions. And so I basically said to myself, well, I'm going to have to have science. I'm going to have numbers to make people comfortable with this. And so, you know, with facial coding, I was able to use it in focus groups, for instance, which are terribly beset with group dynamics. You know, you raised your hand, so I'll raise my hand and say I'm going to buy the product. You know, uh, that the TV commercial is great. So that's one way. And then as the technology got better, of course, through streaming video uh, allows us to look at the video in real time or go back and study it carefully and, and say which of these muscle activities are happening. So in facial coding, just to lay down one key marker here, I mentioned seven emotions. There are 23 expressions that fit one or more of those seven emotions. So in applying it in business, mostly looking at consumer response, but I did some executive coaching as well. For instance, I applied it in pro sports. I applied it uh, in politics as a pundit for presidential debates. Uh, there's so many places you can take it, but it's really going after those 23 expressions. Hmm. So if I'm consciously deciphering what someone is displaying in their face, like I really mastered facial coding, it, it, is that required to understand it, or is there also some innate recognition? Do you know? Do I feel the emotions even if I don't, if not seeing the face? Sure, I, I'm not trying to make everybody on this show immediate master. Although, yeah, you know, I think my book could take them a long ways. But let's go to some real basics, which I didn't know back when I had the PhD, but didn't have the EQ to go with the IQ. Um, anger. Let's go back to anger because it's such a prevalent emotion. The essence of anger is to hit. You know, it's almost like a snake coiling, waiting to strike. So with anger, the way it shows on someone's face, you don't have to be a facial coder just to say, is there a tension there? Is there a pressure, a condensing, like the lips pressed together, for instance? Uh, the eyebrows can lower, the, the eyes can go narrow, and the lower eyelid gets taut and straight. So you don't have to get to each of the particulars. Just say, is there a pressure, a, a condensing going on with somebody? There's a really good odds that they're angry. Uh, disgust as an emotion is something smells bad, tastes bad. I want to get away from it. So not surprisingly, what happens? The, the upper lip curls, like, oh, bad smell, bad taste, rather. I got to back off from it. Or the nose wrinkles, like, oh, that's ugly. I have to get away from that. Think of it as trying to lift up and away from a situation. So each of the emotions has this a little quick, easy handle, even if you don't know all the particulars of the 23 expressions. Okay. And w w again, without consciously decoding people, without mastering the skill set, how accurate is our, you know, innate intuitive gauging of, of an emotion that's facing us? We're not very good unless we work a bit harder at it. I mentioned earlier uh, our susceptibility to going with the words as if we almost want to be lied to. For, the, for this book, I went ahead. There's 173 celebrities, and I had people do surveys. They could skip any celebrity they didn't think they knew well, but I gave them the seven emotions, and I said, which emotion do you think is the most characteristic emotion for that celebrity and the secondary most characteristic? And their accuracy rate was around 35%. Hmm. Uh, that's pretty low. Yeah. And that fits some other studies that have been done out there about do we recognize the emotion we're feeling in a particular situation and so forth. So, yeah, we, we're, a, we're a long ways from being Sherlock Holmes. We're, we're a lot closer to Watson. <laughs> and, and you might remember that Sherlock Holmes says to Watson at one point, you have an instinctive grasp of the obvious. <laughs> uh, that's his put down. I'm not even sure we have an instinctive grasp of the obvious always. And I'm talking about myself prior to learning this stuff. We really could go a long ways in using our visual abilities to increase our emotional abilities. Hmm. What about someone that, um, due to shyness or due to being on like the autism spectrum somewhere, just never doesn't look at faces, doesn't make eye to eye contact? Do they have just an, is there no way for them to have? An emotional intelligence, or is it? Are there different ways to pick things up? Well, I mean, I'm not an expert on autism, and actually, some of the early studies, particularly at Cambridge University in England, were looking at applications of facial coding to autism, because although they might have problems with themselves, could they at least pick up, you know, in terms of going what's going on for them? Could they apply emotional intelligence and kind of get there through the, the side alley mm. by picking up the emotions of other people and using that to kind of educate themselves, for instance? So I'd like to think there's, there's always a route forward. You just might have to get a little more ingenious about how you, how you make the progress, but it, it should certainly be possible. And for some guys who might think that emotions are off limits, 
Well, I say, just look at a few photographs of sports fans. I mean, my God, I used to use as a close to a uh, speeches I'd give in corporate life, uh, something in Sports Illustrated. It showed people's reactions at a hockey game when a streaker was climbing over the, the glass to get onto the rink. Everybody in that photograph had an expression. Some were <laughs> amused, some were shocked, some were horrified, some were angry that he was interrupting the game, but everybody had a reaction. Hmm. And, we, and we do. So, it, it, you know, sports is just one place, but it, it goes every place. So there shouldn't be boundaries to this. Right. So you mentioned a really low accuracy rate for the celebrities when people try to, you know, um, assume or guess their dominant emotion. And that, like, that makes a lot of sense to me because celebrities are putting on masks. You know, where are people judging performances as opposed to people? So do you see similar results when people are, you know, um, looking at, you know, photographs of, of friends and family or people they don't know at all? Sure. Well, let, let's go back. I mean, I'm going to answer that question in two ways. The first one is for the book to have valid, good research. I stayed absolutely away from the glam photographs. You know, the moment when they're receiving an award at a ceremony or this or that. I wasn't interested in that. I wanted the more candid photographs to the extent I could find them. Okay. Yeah, I had to work with what was available in the public. Uh, could there be enough of a disparity in private that this person is at least somewhat different? Yeah, I can't deny that's a possibility, but I tried to cover it by going for the candidates and going for a lot of photographs. I, I was typically looking at at least 50 to 70 photographs per person, okay. uh, really trying to look for the patterns over time. And they, and they do make sense because once I did the coding, and only then did I go back and say, let me start looking into the, the private lives of these people and see if it makes a reasonable matchup. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll go into fear for a moment, just to take two interesting stories of guys who showed a pretty good amount of fear, and you maybe wouldn't expect them. So one is Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was one of the highest people in my study for fear. Well, if you go back into, and I didn't expect that. I mean, I did not expect that as an answer. And once I went back in and I started reading more about Ronald Reagan, not the policies as president, I, the person. Well, his dad was an alcoholic. They moved a lot of times when he was a boy to different towns around in Illinois. It was a very unstable household. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a first thing. Uh, then in Hollywood, Jane Wyman chose to divorce him. The reason he ended up with Nancy is because he got dumped by Jane Wyman. Um, and he didn't really succeed in Hollywood. Really, you know, the politics was the moment where he succeeded, but then suddenly dementia started to come on. There he was out in the limelight, but he's suffering increasingly from dementia. So there were lots of intervals and lots of factors in his life that actually made him pretty profoundly uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but he tried to battle through it. Uh, another one would be R Wayne Gretzky. I mean, Wayne Gretzky, they used to do these strength tests when he was an Edmonton Oiler. He came in dead last every time among his teammates, dead last. The guy weighed like 20 pounds less than anybody else on the team. Um, you know, it was skating. It was, it was his acumen on the ice. When the guy was first a great scorer, you know, way back when he was a kid, he was so small that his jersey used to get caught up in his skates. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so it tells you a lot of things. One is that guys can have fear too. And it's legitimate motion that it happens. It means you can still be successful. And, um, you know, and, and I think that's empowering. That's important. So you, we talked about the emotions are there, but people can try to mask them. So yeah. does, does, does lying show up in a face as an emotion? or like, what, Well, that's, that's a really interesting one uh, because there is no lying muscle in the face. I guess going back to Darwin, it would be a really bad thing if there was an obvious muscle movement that gave away the fact you were lying. You probably wouldn't be around at dinner time. Uh, you, you know, your, your wife or your business allies or some of the customers would kill you, kill you off. Um, so, and, and furthermore, if you knew it, you'd probably go to uh, plastic surgery or the, you know, Botox center or something to try to take care of it. But there is a checklist you can look for. So, for instance, uh, fear. Some people, when they're telling a lie, go right to fear because they're uncomfortable in that moment. Uh, Richard Nixon was a bad liar, actually. <laughs> and uh, it, it, he, he sweated. It just came out. Uh, some people will actually show contempt when they're lying. Bernie Madoff, which, think about his last name, made off with the money. I mean, can you make this stuff up? I mean, what a great name for the guy with the number one Ponzi scheme of all time, Bernie made off with the money. Um, he showed contempt. He didn't respect his victims. 
So the corner of his mouth will kind of lift up and out in this kind of sneer, smile kind of expression. Some people get angry. Uh, think of Bill Clinton saying, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. So you get really indignant that like, how dare you question my veracity? Uh, when you have every reason to question their veracity because actually they're lying. Um, so, you know, Lance Armstrong did the same thing regarding whether or not he was cheating, you know, in his biking career, you know, Tour de France and all of that. So there, there are different places people can go. You just kind of have to go to, down to the punch list and you have to take into account who they are. Again, what's their pattern? Uh, if they tend to sneer a lot, uh, you know, is some of that involving chicanery, lying? It's worth investigating. Cool. And in, in all of your research and, and years of research and looking at different faces, are, are there some emotions that men are more likely to show than women? Or is it pretty equal just for all humans? How, how does that show up? No, it's not terribly equal. Uh, I'll just go through each of the seven emotions. Guys show less happiness than women. Now, I think that it's sometimes true that a guy's worth has been calibrated. I don't want to be essentialist about this or sexist, but I think that sometimes based on how society has been constructed, women have, you know, their value has been placed on being nice and or being beautiful. A guy has been based on being strong and capable and making money. Now, that's historically. The world's changed a lot, but... You know, we don't have a new brain every year. We have the brain we were given millions of years ago. And that brain, that caveman, cavewoman brain, probably is such that, you know, guys didn't put as much of a premium on smiling and making nicey nice. And my studies repeatedly show that the guys come in lower on happiness than women do. Guys show more anger. I've already covered that. Um, they want strength. They're going to hit out. They're going to take action. But guys are also, I want to be complimentary to guys. They're also bold. Guys take chances in life. They take risks. They put themselves into situations where that anger can help them muscle through a situation and, and really drive themselves forward. Uh, so those are two of the what are called approach emotions. So happiness to hug, anger to hit. There's one more approach emotion, which is sadness, which is a longing to be hugged. So it's kind of the inverse of happiness. And guys index a little bit higher, not much, but a little bit higher than women on sadness. And I think there's a reason. Uh, women are better socially at bonding and getting a support group going. A lot of guys, that is not a long suit. I divide my friends into two groups. The ones I just do things with, like I go to the baseball game, I do this, I do that, I go camping. And the guys I can talk to. I can have a real conversation, including potentially about my emotions. And there's a separation between the two. And I've tried to figure out fairly quickly who I've got, you know, on my hands. And it tends to separate. So sadness is something that, yeah, guys aren't as good as that. They don't want to slow down and contemplate and ponder. Uh, so that takes care of the approach emotions. Then you have the reactive emotions. And those are surprise and fear. And the guys are higher on fear. And I think some of that has to do with putting ourselves in danger's way of taking chances of being bold and adventuresome. I think some of it has to do again with that lack of support that we don't allow ourselves our feelings. We don't allow ourselves to confide. It's a, it's a more difficult path to go alone. Mm -hmm. It just is. I mean, there are studies that show that the number one thing that causes happiness at work, you've got a best friend at work. Now, hopefully you got a best friend out of work, but it really helps to have a best friend at work as well. Surprise, if I remember right, is actually a little bit higher for women than for guys. Surprise is the eyes go wide, the eyebrows lift. You are taking in more information. And also the mouth tends to drop open a little bit as if you're taking in air in case you have to run. Because, of course, if the surprise is warranted and is a negative surprise, you might have to do flee <laughs> rather than fight, for instance. And if you think about that, and I don't want to jump to overly grand conclusions, but by and large, women are physically not as strong as men. It might be true that historically they had a child to care, so they couldn't move as fast. Uh, they might have not been the one with the earning power, historically, not true necessarily at all now. There could be some reasons why women really need to pay attention to their surroundings. There's a wonderful stanza from a poem by Wallace Stevens where he says, a duchess is not a duchess a hundred yards from the carriage. Women 
understand this. Context, your surroundings, whether or not you're safe in a moment, I think could be a really good reason why the Duchess is not a Duchess 100 yards from the carriage. You no longer have the power once you lost the regal trappings. Hmm. So I think women could be really keen on that. This leaves two other emotions. These are the scorning emotions. And they are disgust and they are contempt. And the guys are higher on contempt. And there's an upside and a downside to contempt. The upside is it could mean you're confident, you're cocky. Uh, a lot of athletes, good successful athletes in my book, showed a lot of contempt, for instance. You know, I rule the roost. <laughs> I hit 300 home runs in my career. I can do it. Um, so it can show a confidence. But it can also show a disrespect, like you're looking down on somebody, like you're beneath me. Let's take Tom Brady. He shows a lot of contempt on his face. Well, he's, he's got six Super Bowl rings, so he has a reason to feel pretty good about himself. Um, so you might forgive him, especially when there's a smile accompanying it. But if someone shows an angry expression along with a contempt expression, there's a really good chance that they're dismissing you. Hmm. So that leaves just one other emotion, which is disgust. And the women show more disgust than the men. And here I'm quite certain for the reason. Because again, disgust is bad taste, bad smell. If you look at sensory tests of women and men's ability to discern different smells, different odors, it's a slaughter fest. It is the little bighorn. The women got like 97% dominance, having a better acuity for smells than for men. Uh, so you have your great chefs, and a lot of them are guys. But by and large, daily cooking, I'm willing to wager a bet that women are better cooks. And some of it could be aided by the smells that they are taking in. They, for every sense other than sight, women are more acute. And so disgust makes so much sense because they can pick out when it's a bad odor, when it's a bad you know, taste that they want to get away from. Cool. So we've got approach, reactive, and scorning as kind of the three categories of emotions? That is correct. All right. And you mentioned that often it, it's a mix. It, it, is, it, is it rarely one emotion on somebody's face at a time? Sure. Of these 23 expressions, I believe it's 11 that go to a single emotion. Oh, okay. That leaves another more than half of them <laughs> that go to, more, to at least two, sometimes three, and in a couple of cases, particularly involving surprise, because surprise is almost like a pre-emotion. Hmm. You know, something happens, you're alert to it, and then you're trying to decipher as quickly as you can, good surprise, bad surprise. Did I get a new car for Christmas? Did I get a new car accident? Which one is it? When, um, when there's multiple emotions on somebody's face, does it cross the categories? Can someone be reactive and oh, oh. welcoming at the same time? Or Oh, absolutely. So uh, let's take John McEnroe. I have to be a tennis player. John McEnroe is almost the same age as me. We're both left-handed. Uh, but he has a little bit more talent than I have. John, John has across two of these categories simultaneously if you look at his top two emotions. Big surprise. John has a problem with anger. <laughs> he threw tennis rackets. Uh, he got thrown out of tournaments. Uh, but he's also fearful, actually. So there's a part of John that probably was acting out and it was so important for him to be a champion because some part of him didn't feel perhaps loved or valued or appreciated. So there's some little boy in him, you know, seeking some solace. Mm. And, and that's an interesting combination. So that pulls him across the dimensions and it's true for, for a lot of people, quite honestly. Um, so we can be, we might have even two or three expressions in the moment. So I'm a facial coder. I'm saying, is there one that's kind of dominant that rides over more than one of these expressions? Or does it settle down and after they go through that little burst of emoting, is there an emotion that appears on the backside in that moment? Um, those can be clues as to what I'm dealing with for that person. Now, long term, as I said, I'm looking for the signature expressions. Mm -hmm. But in the moment, I'm looking for what's popping up. You know, what's, you know it's almost like uh, you know, popcorn popping. You know, <laughs> what, what things are showing up going in the bowl at this moment cool so we talked about areas that guys are higher on is is there one that across the board is is most dominant for for men as an overall category well it you have to look at it differently based on the volume of the emoting uh because i've given you seven emotions and three categories but they are not even remotely equal okay. for most people happiness and anger two of the three approach emotions constitute about 70% of our emoting, 
Um, so, you know, yes, guys are, you know, by a percentage greatly above women. But then when you take into account that about 30% of our emoting is anger, that percentage difference doesn't look so big. If you want to look for a per pure percentage difference where there's a big gap between men and women, you'd probably have to go to contempt, actually. Hmm. Uh, and the next one would be fear. And in both those two categories, there is a small but significant difference. And while anger and, and uh, happiness are about 70% of our emoting, uh, surprise and fear are about 10, 12% of our emoting, typically as a person uh, in my studies over these 20 years. And disgust and contempt are really kind of the, the extra flavor. Uh, so they're quite small. They're like three, four, five percent typically. Uh, you can think of contempt if uh, you know a wedding ring is you know the great package in the little box. Contempt is uh, you know a big toxic watch out call in a very small box as well because it's really a very small percentage of our emoting. Hmm. So you, you, you earlier mentioned that so much of this can be early childhood trauma that creates our. Uh, kind of base emotions and and what we yes. show the most what we feel so if if someone you know going through the life they reach they reach middle age let's say and they start really doing some intense work and and knowing their selves more and and therapy and and finally feeling all those emotions what, does their face change does their dominant emotion begin to change after doing such work well that is an excellent question i almost never get asked that question in all the interviews and, and things I've been on stage for, they can change. And I think that's really reassuring. Human beings, there's a, there's a relative degree of plasticity to us. We can adapt and change. Uh, I would probably say that I've always been a, a happy camper, but I would probably say I was also more susceptible to anger earlier in my life. And I think some of that had to do with my relationship with my father which was not the most satisfying one, uh, including actually being whipped by, with a leather belt. My dad was a farm boy. And so that was a, his idea of how you dealt with these things. And the last time my father ever tried it, uh, he left the room afterwards and I sat on my bed and I said, next time you're going to have to beat me up and then you can whip me, but I'm going to fight you. And he must have known. I'm not saying he was the highest guy for EQ, uh, but he was no dummy. He was a 3M, executive, 3M company executive. Mm -hmm. And I think he figured out that that wasn't going to work anymore. But I had for the longest time, a, I would have to call a fairly unresolved relationship with my dad. Uh, it's a lot better in the last 20 years. And that's probably could help as to why the anger went down. Mm -hmm. uh, it could also be just that I got emotionally smarter over time. Uh, so yes, I, I think we really can grow. Uh, by understanding these emotions and putting them into play in situations. But on the other hand, I would say that we can never entirely get away from trying to go back and say, let's do the homework. And the homework means let's understand what went on in those early years. So I mentioned Balbi earlier, and maybe you know this, other guests have talked about Balbi. But I was on a plane ride on a business trip, and there was a, uh, a long piece in Newsweek about early childhood development. And I was absolutely fascinated. The most fascinating piece was Balbi's work. And he said, basically, you have three kinds of children. You have the securely attached. They have a good relationship, particularly with the mom often. And they're pretty placid. And happiness is probably a pretty likely emotional outcome from all of this. Then you have the anxiously attached, which maybe they spend some time with their mother. Sometimes they back off. Sometimes the mother doesn't want to deal with them. You know, so it, it's a it's a back and forth, and it's easy to see from the title "anxiously attached." You know that that fear may may come into that picture, for instance. And then you have those who are avoidant; they have not been able to form a successful relationship with their mother, and it could be their father certainly as well. It might mean that they're not emotionally available. Maybe they're working two jobs; they're not physically available. Uh, it may just be things in their own makeup and background. But it means that an avoidant person kind of gives up on finding solace hmm. from the parent figures. So it's easy to imagine sag sadness can come from that. It's sad, easy to imagine actually the anger can come from that, that there's a resentment that builds up. It might be subdued, but like, you know, it just didn't work. You go to the person who is, I believe, number one in my book for anger. It's the rapper Eminem. And his backstory, once I, you know, delved into it, was, you know, father was out of the picture, like, almost immediately. Mom had a very skittish career. I don't think you could even call it a career. She kind of got by. She happily took whatever money Eminem had, you know, stole it from him, <laughs> made use of it for alcohol, whatever else. 
uh, even demanded the money, didn't just steal it from her, like said, you got any money, it's mine, and left her son bereft. So it's not so hard to imagine that that was not a successful relationship, and, and he moved on. Uh, whether he's applied EQ, I don't know. <laughs> uh, he sometimes has made comments in interviews that, you know, I, I don't have a problem with anger. Well, I see a lot of anger on his face, so I think there's some progress that could be made on that front. So I, I think the, the Balbi stuff really tells you there's these three categories. And to understand yourself, and I did do this work when I went through the divorce, and you know, I went and saw the psychiatrist, and she, I said, you know, this is what's going on with me. And she basically, after a few questions, said, no, 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 no. I want to go back and talk about your childhood. That's where we're going to do the real work, first of all. And I said, well, I read this piece by Balby, and she was delighted that I'd read that. And we could have a really good conversation. But then I went back and I talked to my mom. My dad was not open to the conversation. But I went back to my mom and she said, yes, I'm going to be honest with you. She said, I wasn't really looking to have a child at that point. I was just finishing college. In fact, I dropped out of college senior year to get married. And then, you know, you came along and I love you very much. But in all honesty, I, I wasn't looking to be a mom at that point. And he said, by the time your sister came along, I think I'd adjusted a lot more. I was much more accepting the role of being a mom. By the point that you came into my life, I would have much rather been in college still. That's what I wanted to do. That's what my mom wanted to do. That's why she had had the tuition money set aside for me. I felt like I was letting my own mom down. And uh, my mom says, this is actually a true story. She said, we were going back home on the train ride from Grand Forks to Minot, North Dakota. And she said, I passed you along to anyone on the train who wanted to hold you. Anybody else who wanted to hold you. Now, my mom's a warm and good person. We get along really well. I, I love my mom. I think she was just in a situation that wasn't the situation she wanted at that point in her life. And when she told me that story, I went, oh, I think I just connected a lot of dots. Yeah. <laughs> and that helped me make real progress. Hmm. And so this is all humbling work, but it's useful work. And I, I do think I'm a different person. Hmm. I think I'm more understanding, more accepting. Uh, I, I'd like to think I'm a better person than I, not that I was, you know, Genghis Khan before, but I'd like to think I'm pretty good now. I really try. I really try. That certainly comes across. I, I, I don't, I don't know what you were before in the past, but yeah, you, you very, you seem very genuine and, and warm. And, you know, what, what I'm marveling at the most from, from famous faces decoded, focusing on celebrities and pop culture, it gives it this kind of light attitude to the whole notion of, of of facial coding but it really is it opens doors to tremendous personal growth and and better interpersonal relationships so i i love that there's so much depth here and that you're willing to share it and your own experiences and and upbringing to discover this work so well, well thank you I, I was looking forward to this this interview and this conversation because when i wrote famous faces to code i said okay at some level there might be some people who just simply want to read the celebrity stories and that's fine you know, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll work in a little bit of learnings, but if they want to take it at that level, that's where it goes. And then I said, if they want to go down a level, they can go to EQ. They can understand what triggers these emotions, what they mean, and so forth. And then if they want to go to the deepest level and put the whole package together, now they can add in the facial coding and the tells on the face so they can see themselves better, they can see other people better, and have this in-the-moment intelligence as to what's going down. Uh, I mean, this is a program for guys. You know, when I was a kid, I really loved military stuff. I used to have a map on my wall of all the Civil War battles. Well, one of the reasons why Lee lost Gettysburg, among others, is that Jeb Stewart got lost in the countryside of Pennsylvania. So Lee didn't have any idea who he was fighting or what was going on. And I think of that sometimes with facial coding. If you don't know what's going on with other people, you really think you're going to win and prevail and make the kind of progress you could make? with more understanding mm. and there are these quick visual tells that are out there i mean there's a wealth of information just sitting right in front of us leonardo da vinci was the world's first facial coder frankly he didn't wait for charles darwin he did work on anatomy he was interested in how the muscles movement in the face gave us the expressions on our face mm. that's why mona lisa is such a rich painting because it actually has multiple emotions on his face mm. on her face rather there is anger there is contempt, and there is some disgust and sadness. And yeah, there's a smile. But when you say the Mona Lisa smile, oh, you're missing so much of the picture. Yeah. The 25 square inches of the most valuable visual territory on earth, I swear to God, is around your eyes, nose, and mouth. 
because that's where those muscles come into play. And that's that chance to pick up so much wealthy understanding of your world. Mm. Really is. Mm. And, and by the way, just to go back to Genghis Khan, so I, just to protect myself. Uh, so, for instance, I was captain of my high school soccer team. I played center midfield. I got the, the ball and I passed it to the goal scorers. I did not have to be the scorer himself. I was just happy to be a contributor. So I don't think I was out there, you know, you know, marauding and killing people or anything. Uh, but uh, could I make some progress from my understanding of who I was then as a boy? Oh, I think so. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. It, do you have sons? No, I do not have any children. That probably has to go back to that uh, relationship with my dad. Hmm. Uh, I didn't race into having kids. It, it, it didn't happen for me. And my wife did not have kids either. Um, so it was a second marriage, you know, both sides and um, you know that's how it worked out but uh, she's also very keen on emotional intelligence so uh, I got lucky uh, I got a good fit cool so but I uh, let's see based on your upbringing if you had had children I imagine you would have consciously done things in a different manner oh absolutely yeah. absolutely no, no belt whippings yeah. for, okay. for one thing uh, a lot more hogging you know and kids I mean especially my sister has six so there was not a lot of pressure on me to be, you know, to have kids myself. Uh, she said, yeah, I kept having kids because I want to remember how much I loved them before they became teen teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> so you uh, needed a fresh supply? <laughs> a fresh supply. And that's true. I mean, a kid from about, you know, in the get past the terrible twos from about three to seven, eight, nine, ten. That, that's, a, that's a wonderful time period. I mean, I, I certainly enjoyed being around my nieces and my nephews. And I tried to be an EQ uncle. Uh, absolutely. And give them some attention because when you got six kids, you're definitely fighting for attention. Hmm. Now, it, so you you're in the business world. You're a consultant to lots of different companies, and I can see, you know, obvious places this helps to come up um, in terms of marketing focus groups or in terms jury selection, all sorts of different things. Is 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 there a danger or a downside to to software that just starts automatically accurately reading people? Sure. Well, I was the one who, who brought this tool into the business world. And uh, so then you got kind of the, the small fry imitators who are out there and they're doing pretty well. And they, they're the ones who I don't have a skill for, for uh, writing code. That, that's, that's not me. Uh, you know, part of my background is actually I lived in Italy as a boy. Uh, we moved there when I was six. I did not know the language at first. I had to read nonverbals. I went to an Italian first grade in a fishing village. And I could only do the math unit. I waited all day for the math unit because I could do math. And fortunately for me, Italians have a lot of body language, speaking of body language. So there was definitely some things there. And then as we headed back to the U.S., we came up through uh, uh, Holland and England, and I saw Rembrandt paintings. And Rembrandt, of course, is universally acclaimed for his sensitivity of the facial expressions in his portraits. So I was kind of clued to go that route, but I'm not a coder. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that happened was some of these smaller companies said, oh, Dan's having success. So yeah, they went there. Now it's kind of like the smaller fish getting eaten by the whale. So now you have Facebook and Google and Microsoft and a uh, Chinese company, they are all automating facial coding. And this is gonna be tied into AI. And hopefully there are some upsides to this because the reason I brought into business was, sure, I, I needed to make a living. I thought this was an interesting way to do it. But I had a real mission to what I was doing, I have to tell you, which is I also wanted to humanize business. Hmm. I wanted companies to take their employees and their customers more seriously as holistic people who weren't just pocketbooks and purses. <laughs> they were people. And were you going to satisfy them, please them, show respect for them? Uh, and hopefully it can be used in that way. Uh, I always knew it could be used for national security, but it can also be used for surveillance. So I mentioned there is a Chinese company building it, valued at $2 billion, uh, a very tight fit with the, the uh, government of China. And in Northwest China, they are using this on the Uyghurs, Muslim people and surveilling them and they are pulling them in for indoctrination and so forth and if they don't seem to be taking well to the indoctrination because their face gives away mm -hmm. the fact that they're not buying it they can be subject to even more interrogation mm -hmm. or more indoctrination so so you know I, there's an upside and a downside it can really lift us it can really also uh create some problems for us but in the automation to answer your question specifically they have to be careful about head movement you know, a tilt of the head could lead them to misread what's going on, as crazy as that sounds. Uh, the lighting, 
could be a problem. Uh, their databases could be a problem. Uh, they tend to be pretty heavily populated with white male figures. Uh, and there's research to show that they are not very good at picking up female faces or anyone of color, particularly African Americans. And it's true the darker skin with lighting makes it harder. I mean, a, a, a manual facial coder like myself can fight through that. A camera has more difficulty. And there's one more problem. They're, they're picking up too much subtle little noise and thinking it's a real signal. So I'll give you an example of what I mean. Somebody cleverly put a doll, a plastic doll in front of a webcam and supposedly had it watch a TV commercial. The software said it had a series of emotional reactions to the commercial. It most assuredly did not. Yeah. However, the software thought it picked up little flickerings, which is probably changes in shadow. Maybe there's an overhead fan in the room changing the, the air currents. Who knows what was causing it? But supposedly all these reactions. So these little quick subtle expressions, these micro expressions can be very useful to knowing what's going on. But they also run the risk of, of overreading, overinterpreting, making something out of nothing. Right. Uh, there's, a, there's a wonderful expression that from, uh, from 500 rabbits, you cannot make a horse. Be careful you don't have 500 rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've not heard that. That's good. Cool. You know, and, and, and all the work you've done um, on yourself, in your relationships, and, and, and in this field of, of emotions and facial coding, is there something that stands out as something you wish more men realized? Oh, that's a good question. I, I'm going to go to a, a sad but important incident. The, the importance of connecting with other guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, you might be fortunate and if you're in a relationship, your, your wife forgives you for having close female friends and trusts you and doesn't have concerns. But I, I'd say a lot of times that's not an option or it's an option you can only go so far down the road with without creating some problems in your personal relationship. So it, it's really good to find, I mentioned earlier, you know, my male friends I can just do things with and my male friends I can have a conversation with. It is really good to find at least one guy you can have a real conversation with in your life. You need that. And I'm going to give you an instance. I was doing some work for Mike Leach. He you know, now moved on to back into the Southern Conference, but he was at that time the head coach at Washington State football team. And I was looking at all his team, trying to help him assess, you know, what was team chemistry and who to play in what situations. And I came to him and I said, I'm worried about one of your linemen. Because the other guys really look like they've bonded, they get along well, they're showing, you know, happiness and anger and disgust. And disgust, by the way, is a pretty good emotion in sports. I've found that it ties in well to guys who want to do exceedingly well, that mediocrity disgusts them. Um, but I said, you got, Mike, you got one guy who, sh who shows sadness on his face. And a lot of it, and I don't think he's tied into the unit. And, you know, that's these five linemen in football. They're a unit. They're going to eat together. They're going to be on the line together. And I'm sad to report that that guy tried to commit suicide about, I don't know, six weeks after I was there kind of assessing the team for Mike. Hmm. So, um, you know, I told him, I said, I got this concern. And, and, it, and the guy survived, fortunately. But uh, uh, I was accurate. Um, and I'm not going to pretend facial coding is 100% accurate or Dan Hill is infallible or some crazy thing like that. Uh, but that was that guy's situation. And I was concerned. That was the number one thing that stayed with me when I left is this guy really needs a friend on the team. Mm -hmm. And uh, none of his immediate you know, compatriots on that line are his, are his friend. He, he needs some help. Mm -hmm. That's sad. Yeah, it is sad. Yeah. You know, in you mentioned you're, 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 you have your two groups of guys. Do, do your friends know which group they're in? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> okay. just, just like my wife, for instance, has a signature expression. And I have gotten some people to try to get me to tell what it is. And I do not tell. Okay. And my wife, actually, very early on, like about our fifth date, uh, we were out with some friends. We're in a, a, a bar. And they said, so what's Karen's expression? And I refused to say what it was. And she told me later on when we got married, she said, that was the moment when I knew I could trust you, <laughs> that you would have my back for me. And uh, that's when I was emotionally ready to, to you know, step forward. And so um, that I do not disclose. Good. So you're not only skilled, you're wise. <laughs> I, I do try to be wise. <laughs> awesome. Um, uh, Dan, again, I, I find this fascinating. I, I really recommend the book. It, again, it, it's fun and informative. So... You know, you may feel like you're reading, you know, the National Enquirer a bit, and then you actually learn things. So I find it's a great mix. Um, where can people find about more about the book, Famous Faces Decoded, more about what you're doing, what you're up to? 
Sure. The, the book is, of course, on Amazon, uh, but you can also click on it easily by going to my website, which is danhill.sensorylogic.com. That's sensory as in your five senses, S-E-N-S-O-R-Y, logic.com. I do have a blog called Faces of the Week, and people can find that at emotionswizard.com. And the other thing is, uh, once the almost inevitable recession comes along with, and I'm sorry, I guess I'll mention the coronavirus finally in this program, uh, once we climb out of that recession or worse, God knows what it could prove to be, uh, I am planning to launch some one-day uh, retreats. And they will be sometimes focused on you know, business applications like uh, advertising and HR and leadership, sales and so forth. But I'm intending other ones to be more personal for personal development. And uh, when I'm not in Minnesota, I'm in California in the winter months because the weather's a little better than Minnesota. Uh, they don't know what uh, wind chill means as a term <laughs> in California. Uh, so I'm going to run them out of Palm Springs and uh, people can fly in, get some nice weather in the winter month and go down the path of personal development. So they're going to be small groups. I'm not trying for some cattle call. I want them to be more personal, more intimate. Right. So they'll probably be capped at like 25 people. And so if you, if you keep checking on my website or just, you know, send me an email and said, put me on the list, uh, I can alert people when the time comes. Cool. Cool. And uh, wherever you're listening to this, if you can't capture all this, just visit realmenfeel.org. And in the show notes on the blog of the site, uh, we'll have all the information for and links for Dan's books and the websites he's mentioned. So you can uh, learn more about this um, today or in the future. When, uh, or I guess my future might be your today, <laughs> like, whatever it is. <laughs> well, however it works. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we did, you know, we intentionally having a show, not dealing with the virus at all, but with communicating with people when you can't do the approach, when you can't actually do the hugging that some of our emotions say we want or need or are willing to do, you know, this can be a great time to experiment with these skill sets and watch people on video. And when you're connecting um, with, with friends, with strangers, with, with classes, whatever it is, just a, a way to like, oh, what am, what am I seeing? And, you know, get, uh, and you have multiple books. This is just your latest one. So the multiple yeah, books yeah, no, there's, there's, actually, there's actually eight different books. But yeah, it's a great, it's a great time to be Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Quite, quite honestly, I mean, I use it when I'm watching TV shows. Uh, if I look at a photograph in the news, I mean, if we go back to the Iraq war before the surge, there was two generals testifying to Congress saying the war was going well. I looked at the photograph and went, oh, no, this war is not going well whatsoever. Uh, there is so much information on the face. It is the most valuable, again, 25 square inches of territory in the world. So I say have at it and you will be better for it. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, that, that, that's a, a great attitude and outlook. And yeah, again, it rings very true to, to the little work I've done with this. Um, I couldn't agree more. So thank you again, Dan, for, for being here and sharing all of your expertise. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, wherever you're listening, wherever you're discovering that real men feel, um, give us some approachable emotions and a share, a like, a subscription, a review, whatever fits for you. And through all this chaotic time, you know, I'm confident that we will all come through this and, and indeed for the better. Right? So maybe we'll all be willing to feel. We'll all be willing to know ourselves. You can, you can take this time and, and dig deeper into yourself, into your relationship, into your loved ones, uh, and you know, be willing to look at and improve yourself, perhaps, if you've yeah, no, you extra time. Yeah, no, it's a moment to slow down in some respects as you're, you're cooped up, you're confined. It's a chance, on the other hand, paradoxically, to really move forward. You're going to get to know the people who share your household better through this enforced time, but it's a chance to go online through your TV set. Uh, you can absolutely apply this. I mean, I, I love just watching the, the cast of TV shows and saying, you know, is there a dominant emotion? How, how are they interacting? You know, there, there's so many chances to apply this and a lot of them can be perfectly fun and some of them can be perfectly serious. You can, you can go the, the whole nine yards. Again, thanks again, Dan. Thanks again for listening. And through this all, be good to yourself. Yes. Be well, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thank you for listening to Real Men Feel. Contact us at realmenfeel at gmail.com. Learn more about Andy Grant at theandygrant.com. Please subscribe to this podcast and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, TuneIn, or wherever you are discovering Real Men Feel.